Jiren, an elder care specialist currently in Jaslok Hospital. And uh, the thing with geriatrics per se is the motto is to give a holistic care to the older person. So how we are different than any other, other person is that we actually try to invest a lot of time uh, seeing the older person. Uh, my assessment, which is known as a comprehensive geriatric assessment takes me at least you can say something to 60 to 90 minutes the first time I see an older person purely because we do not only focus on the domain of uh, uh, you can say uh, the medical part we also take history about the fall risk then presence absence of urinary incontinence then there is a memory problem, if there is any anxiety problem, any depression problem, then what is the social circle of that particular older person? What is the caregiver status, whether they need help, whether they, whether there is a caregiver who is needed, whether they are uh, living alone, whether there are neighbors, which floor they live in. So it's a holistic kind of a, uh, attitude which is given and geriatrics is all about continuum of care wherein we try to treat the patient that is the older adult not only in the hospital whether it's the opd or the uh, inpatient but also try to provide them that care at home and ultimately we always hope that the older person can be get back and fit back into the society which is the community so it's a continuum of care which flows through all levels and also the most important part of geriatrics is quality of life so the more independent an older person is, the more happier I am. So that is what we strive for. We try to make them more uh, independent. And like for, for pediatrics, it's a doctor who takes care of children. Geriatrics is basically a doctor. Geriatrician is a doctor who takes care of older adults above 60. And older adults can be divided into young, old, middle, old, old, old. So the young, old will be 60 to 69. Middle, old will be 70 to 79. And old, old will be more than 80 years. So we try to compare all the spectrum of disorders, which includes mental, physical, social, psychosocial, and also try to give them a holistic kind of a treatment. So that is what is what, what geriatrics is about. And it's a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary function, wherein we I also need team, teammates like a, a dietitian, a physiotherapist, a nurse, and plus minus maybe an ophthalmologist because the eyes are very important, hearing is very important, an ENT specialist or even a dentist because these three things are very important. So the focus is on quality of life and teamwork and provide a holistic experience. Once uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Prem uh, to give us a talk on anxiety and stress among seniors. Uh, Dr. Owen, on to you. Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Selle. So yeah, uh, as far as anxiety is concerned, we talked about depression some time back, but I think anxiety is also very important. And uh, in these times, I would not particularly pertain to anxiety and stress only in these times. I will just try to talk about overall. I'll just try to take around 10 to 15 minutes of yours. And then of course, the floor will be open for any questions you want to ask. So there are certain types of anxiety disorders and that's why we have to see those symptoms in older adults. So the types include, there is something known as a generalized anxiety disorder, wherein they, the older adult will not experience it unless later in their life. So they'll be overtly anxious, easily startled, have a very difficulty in relaxing, trouble in concentrating, difficulty in falling in sleep, always feeling that they are at an edge then sometimes rapid heart rate, rapid breathing, sweating, dry mouth, then a bit of dizziness, headaches. Now this is of course generalized anxiety disorder. Then there is something known as panic disorder. People with panic disorder just develop attacks in which it's, it's quite terrifying because at that particular time, they might just feel that they're absolutely going to die or they are, going to, they are not going to recover out of it. We have to be very careful as geriatricians and clinicians that we do not confuse a panic attack with a heart attack because sometimes it can be a very similar kind of presentation. So there are certain triggers why it might happen. For example, suddenly if an older person has to go into a crowd or if an older person has to go into public places which is not used, place all these thoughts are the ones which can actually give a panic attack what can happen in this sudden nausea vomiting feeling really numb then weakness trembling 
now it's very important that these uh, i'm reiterating that these symptoms can also happen like chest pain nausea feeling of sweatiness this can happen in a heart attack also so if at all there is very similar your healthcare provider you should contact and you should not only think that it is just a panic attack then there are a lot of phobias phobias are there throughout all age groups but i am talking about phobia specifically maybe in older adults a common phobia is an extreme fear of older adults maybe going into public or sometimes there is something known which is very common is agoraphobia which may be associated with fear of falling then lot of older adults have the phobia of fear of being isolated so there are two types of phobias one is specific phobias and one is social phobias the specific phobias are common among all age groups i will like try to highlight you. there are certain phobias for people for specific insects or for example animals like snakes and spiders or enclosed spaces phobia while you want to fly then social phobias is very common where people just don't want to go on public they are very difficult to actually open up they may worry about that particular event for example if they have to go out they'll worry about it for days together and then they will be like no i need to i need to think about that event whether it's one one week one month down the line also it will be giving them a lot of stress then there is something known as an ocd which is an obstructive or which is a obsessive compulsive disorder now it is this that urge for a person to keep doing the things again and again again and again for example it's very commonly seen with hand washing certain people just feel i have touched this surface i have touched that surface i have i have touched shaking hands with a stranger seen here seen there checking those so then they keep washing their hands irrespective of a number of times which it is actually needed then there is another thing which people very commonly have is locking doors in spite of locking the door already they check the locks maybe even for 5 10 more minutes 15 more minutes keep checking whether it's locked 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 or not so that can be the problem with an ocd is it can be disabling because when you're working also you will get that urge to do things and then it can also affect relationships so for example in an older adult sometimes depression or dementia can lead to the development of an ocd for example if a person has difficulty in remembering paying a bill then they will forget it and they'll keep seeing the calendar saying that no 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 again and again again and again then there is something known as hoarding disorder in this uh, that particular person will not be taking care of themselves they will just clutter their living space hoarding is almost three times more common in older adults as compared to younger adults then post traumatic disorder this again can happen in any kind of age group uh for example if there is an accident death of any particular person a sibling or a bereavement and those symptoms of ptsd make it difficult for that particular person to live at all so for example it will be seen that the person will have frightening thoughts nightmares irritability guilt that i should have been there for that particular person feeling emotionally numb depressed so these are of course the spectrum of anxiety disorders make no mistake comorbid illnesses in older adults are the ones which cause a lot of anxiety for so person has lung diseases like copd asthma if a in which there is a repeated chance of uh, you can say getting sick then if the person has parkinsons these thyroid problems diabetes hypertension heart problems heart failure which cause a lot of breathing difficulty these cause a lot of anxiety as well so we always try to treat the anxious component of a medical disease as well and it's not that all anxiety is only the psychological thing we have to sort of treat both things at the same time now diagnosis of course and tests which can be sort of done will be when do you have to consider showing yourself if your worry is totally excessive if your anxiety is making it very difficult for you to enjoy life and if your anxiety has got worsen with time you actually have to for the specific diseases as i told you you have to get your tests done so that you obviously are able to sort of see that then what is care and treatment how do we try to care about this one of course we always have drug treatment for anxiety disorders please whenever you are started on any amount of drugs for anxiety please do not try to change the dose or try to change the drugs yourself do not self medicate always try to be in touch with your 
whether it's your geriatrician whether it's your psychiatrist psychologist so that you are able to change the medications only after consulting with them then psychotherapy psychotherapy is very important this is done by trained psychologists trained counselors trained social workers wherein we are able to give you time and try to see what exactly your anxiety disorder is and give you certain relaxation techniques certain techniques wherein you will wherein you will feel more and more relaxed as far as your mind is concerned and you will obviously be able to uh, be more happy and try to overcome that anxiety because anxiety can really sort of kill you from inside so these techniques help for everything or every illness there is always a lifestyle management so it's very very important that you do a lot of yoga and meditation why i am saying is because it helps you in relaxing your mind it will help you in overcoming your anxiety and it's not necessary that you need to go to a yoga class only now because of technology we are able to see videos on youtube or we are able to do zoom zoom yoga classes just try to make sure that you get yoga for the body and mind both so that you can relax then exercise now exercise is very very important regular exercise whether it's aerobic repeated like walking swimming in these times you might actually have to do more of walking at home try to be active in your daily activities at home so that you feel very very fresh and always see that exercise will help you to improve your both mental and physical part then what happens when you actually get really anxious a lot of times you can do what is something known as deep slow breathing just relax take deep slow breaths try to just relax your mind just see whether is that particular situation getting to you close your eyes try to find out a place in your mind where you relax most whether it's a thought of some picture whether it's thought of your family whether it's a thought of some music try to relax and this would obviously automatically help your mind then music can be helpful a lot of other things also can be helpful in giving your mind that particular cooling diet very important in i would say decrease the amount of caffeine tea coffee these are things which can actually increase or lead to more of uh, anxiety always try to talk to your healthcare provider it is very very important then particularly anxiety in times of lockdown stress and anxiety in times of lockdown and covid i would just want to say these things that please do not get anxious of things which are not in your hands especially for example what the government is going to do what the lockdown is going to happen whether it's going to be extended all these administrative decisions are not in your hand so as older adults who are just following the news please do not get tensed about that because whatever happens will happen and we will have to sort of agree with that second is draw inspiration from your own life because you have overcome a lot of obstacles so don't get anxious about this particular covid or lockdown this will also end and we will overcome this together try to keep yourselves busy whether it's a skill whether it's a, whether it's music whether anything that you want to do learn a new language learn new skill memory games participate in daily activities try to keep yourself busy the more busier you are the less anxious you will be because an idle man with a devil's workshop you'll start thinking about things which you are not in your sort of hand anxiety is treatable so please don't feel that it's not treatable it can be treated with medications and non non pharmacological that is even with psychotherapy so it's treatable so don't feel that it's kind of some kind of psycho psychiatric disease psychological disease with which will have a stigma and you will not get treatment no nothing like that and during these times just stay calm because a calm mind will obviously help you to take decisions take care of your health and the anxiety will automatically decrease for the physical diseases please take care of your health take your medicines on time take water take diet on time so that you obviously feel physically and mentally active so this was an overall view on anxiety disorders in older adults we would be open for questions how do i know whether anxiety is worry is something that i need to worry about or do i uh, just think that is something that will go away how do i know when there is actually a problem for which i need help Yeah, in that case, yeah, I would say when you're getting more and more, if the anxiety sort of uh, extends for a few weeks, a month, 
the anxiety has started affecting your quality of life your daily life interfering with your life activities your normal activities whether eating your work or getting stressed about every small thing then that is sort of something you have to start addressing because uh, people can get anxious i mean everybody gets anxious about things in life but they tend to sort of recover after some time after whether it's whether talking to your own kin or whether it is or uh, after uh, i mean relaxing yourself whether it's music but if it sustains and you're not able to concentrate at all it's affecting your daily life your activities then that is the time you have to sort of consult your doctor i would say try to confide on your relatives try to confide on your family members first because they should also know that you have been anxious do not keep it in your mind for a long time because when you build up anxiety it sort of really reflects on your behavior and then you'll end up having behavioral changes and you would get angry you would react at things which are not really uh, appropriate so confide in your relatives but at the same time do not tolerate anxiety it small anxieties will last for small times but if it's lasting for long time then you need to confront then things like difficulty in sleeping concentrating all these things are all worsening of your health condition yes doctor um Are there any other questions for anybody? Uh, remember, you don't have to mute yourself. Doctor, uh, what about uh, you? Know you get up in the night and then uh, you uh, cannot fall asleep, and then you just keep on tossing and turning and tossing, and then it just happens uh, 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 often. And uh, is it something to be worried about? Should, should take a sleeping tab, take a sleeping tablet continuously, or for that particular day? how do you handle this uh, not being able to getting up in the night and not being able to fall asleep again yeah i would say uh, getting up in the night what is the reason of getting up in the night is important for example a lot of older people get up in the night to actually pass urine and uh, increase in frequency of urination so that has to be addressed if that is the cause if not and it is just the fact that you suddenly get up and it takes time for you to sleep so that is a common thing which can happen but once you sort of get up and you are about to go to sleep again i would say try to try to relax yourself again because that particular sleep cycle might have been affected so try to relax it's a new time so try to relax yourself set the mood and do not try do not try to just say that no i should start seeing the mobile or i should start seeing something and then slowly i'll go into sleep no what will happen is your brain will get even more stimulated and then you will not sort of you lose even more sleep then as far as a tablet is concerned see it's very simple it's a very simple choice it's between it's between choosing the sun and choosing the sun it's like on one side you can get sleep by taking a small dose of a tablet and you not getting quality sleep at all so if you are getting sleep taking that tablet then that is not a taboo that's not anything wrong if you are getting good sleep with a small dose of a tablet and you have an entire rest day you are fresh next day that is great but if you are taking that tablet and you have side effects like you think you feel drowsy the entire day entirely then it's an issue but if a small dose you are getting good sleep and you are not having any drowsiness not side effects so having tablet for sleep is not at all anything wrong it's about getting quality sleep 4 to 5 hours with a tablet rather than just being awake the entire night without a tablet so that is always the pros and cons we try to see uh, how small is the dose doctor it varies it varies i mean it's very it's a specific question we i always i always start with the lowest dose possible for an older person because it's a very simple rule for me it's go low and go slow when we go when we start with the small dose and we see if you're not getting sleep then we try to increase it because starting with a higher dose and having side effects is as good as stopping the medication forever so it's always the smallest dose available but we start with thank you doctor thank you oh, yeah. just uh, just uh, to remind everybody uh, i think before taking any medication or starting any medication request you to talk to your gp uh before that because there may be any kind of side effect looking at the other medication that you're having i just thought i'd put it out there uh second is that uh, are there any other questions or else i have one uh doctor are there any food stuff that help reduce anxiety i've always believed chocolate makes me feel good 
does something like that yeah. work does um, eating something sweet eating something uh you know we call it um, comfort food make you feel better yeah comfort comfort foods can make you feel better but you have to realize that uh, you if you are eating it frequently then you are just trying to allay the anxiety rather than treat it uh, but of course there have been things like green tea then even uh, you can say valerian root kava root these are all things which have been seen which try to uh, just relax your mind as compared to others i would say even i would say a warm a warm glass of you can say green tea or any lemon type of tea which soothes you will obviously help in decreasing anxiety but comfort foods i will always be a bit careful purely because if you are taking a lot of that then that might also pertain to the fact that you are actually getting more and more anxious and you are just allaying it at that time just satisfying yourself at that time but not trying to overcome or treat it because a very common discovery that we do in young people and older adults also when they are depressed and anxious is overeating so that is something we need to sort of uh doctor i just wanted to check up yeah. as to what would be the recommended hours for sleeping in the night and second question is is an afternoon nap recommended i would say uh, recommended is around 6 to 8 hours but we know that as we actually get as we get older the amount of sleep is reduced so if you get good amount of sleep between 5 to 6 hours is also good then as far as nap is concerned i would say a half hour nap is good but anything more than half hour maybe even extra an extent an hour should be okay but half is ideal anything more than one one hour tries to tend to make you sleep for even more and then that might sort of start affecting your night sleep as well two to three hours is a strict no no because that will entirely change your biorhythm and in the night you will not get sleep but i would say maybe half an hour is good there is also multiple times if you throughout the day if you take short naps like 10 to 15 minutes which are known as power naps they are they tend to sort of make you a bit more get a panic attack i'll just get to it should be enough of sleep and maybe half an hour of nap is good enough i would say a panic attack is episodic it will always come and go it will be sudden where the person will be like oh my god i'm going to die there will be certain triggers as i said going to a new place going to a public place trapped in a public place you will have this rapid pounding heart rate you will feel your breathing is going fainting trembling you will feel maybe a bit of chest pain you will be sweating nausea you will feel cold but this will all be episodic it will go and then after you just cool down a bit it will come the thing with panic attacks is they are very sudden and they can be really scary and as i highlighted to you a panic attack especially it has been seen in older women can mimic a heart attack also so we as doctors should never we never take a panic attack lightly if a person has a history of heart chest pain or if that particular time you have a chest pain so the biggest difference between a panic attack and other anxieties is it's episodic it will just suddenly come and at that time you will apart from doctor apart from uh, meditation and yoga what are the other de stressors that you would recommend on a normal day because these could be for the yeah 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 uh, i would say music is one then any any hobbies that you try to do because i think uh, the thing of a personal space and a mental space where you feel peace is different for everybody it could be something you want to do in a group or it could be something you want to do alone then so for example nowadays we are having a lot of group groups wherein you are actually having uh, playing instruments together so if you play an instrument then that is there then i would say doing puzzles doing doing things which challenge you i would even say reading books whether it's uh, whether it's spiritual books books of your interest seeing magazines maybe seeing comedy series these are all things it is very relative to each a person so i wouldn't say it's blanket saying that everybody should do this whatever works for you but yeah yoga meditation a bit of exercise these are all well proven 
including music so that your mind obviously relaxes a bit and even as simple as taking deep breaths going to, closing your eyes going to a going to a place in your mind where you actually feel very peaceful that also helps can i ask you my wife would not travel with me to the states because she has a phobia is there any suggestion i went i traveled alone and came back i want to take her the next time but she has the phobia not to travel by plane what can i do to convince yeah. so if she has a if she, by what you are saying if she has a specific phobia of not taking flights then i think i think she will need she will need help out of it i mean we'll have to sort of counsel her out of that because let me be very frank it comes in a bracket of a social phobia where you don't want to go into flights uh, you want to avoid certain situations and this is of course in this case it is a specific phobia which is a fear of flying and as you are saying 22 hours is yes. what it would take for her to take that particular i mean that almost an entire day and it will not be easy for her to do it i would say she would need specifically counseling pertaining to this condition because it's a very specific phobia one two is personally we would i would want her i mean this might not be the right time unfortunately if you are not in covid times then it would be for her to take the shortest flight possible first because yes. i mean that is the that is what would help her hone in her emotions or else if you are thinking of putting her into a 22 hour flight without thinking about the phobia then i don't think that that is something would sort of would work so if it was a normal times yes in these times i specifically feel that she should get we should get into touch with a counselor purely because she has to uh, doctor you know a lot many people are you know recommending this oximeter during this time you know and uh, i understand you know the oxygen level should be 100 uh what is the frequency for the test to be done at home and uh, you know the pulse oximeter and is there any uh, a difference between a normal person and a heart patient so that you know what is the level they should have and you know is there any drop to be worried about yeah for, as far as the oximeter is concerned one is of course if i have to connect it to anxiety if you see it very frequently the you will get anxious and the elderly themselves will also get anxious so try to do it maybe maybe once in the morning once in the evening or if you feel the person is breath not have a chest condition then you anything about 90 is good around 94 to 95 is ideal 94 is a good on room air is a good sort of uh, value for an spo2 monitoring but i would still say don't maybe see it if it is required only once or twice a day because seeing more and more times obviously makes you and the them also anxious corona virus the lockdown is causing us a lot of stress uh we are uh, a lot of us are asking the questions now what how will life come back to normal will life come back to normal i know it's not a medical question but i think the question is really more on will our life uh in terms of uh, you know health come back to normal and by when would you be able to answer this question or is it too big a question to ask no i think i think it's it, it's a question which we are in a process of answering i wouldn't say that uh, we are answering it especially in a it's state like maharashtra and city like bombay where we are seeing an explosion of cases daily so i mean it's a very fluid it's a very fluid sort of situation but i would say with more and more restrictions maybe we'll get lesser and we will get to normal c but i don't know what the new normal is let me be frank maybe the new normal is we have to still maybe maintain social distancing i'll just give you an example how are we ever going to watch movies again i am not quite sure if you are going to watch movies in theaters what is going to be the protocol whether uh, are the number of people going to see less is mask going to be compulsory so i am just saying why would say it's best that we do not speculate how it will work but it's not that it's not that we haven't overcome a lot of things we will try to adjust to whatever things happen but to say that things will be exactly the way before corona is being a bit too ambitious because we would still want to take certain precautions in trying to achieve that normalcy which might come maybe i am not very sure it will come by the end of this year as well because we are it's too early to say the virus is still new we are knowing more and more things about it and once we are actually try to hit the nail on the head we will be able to see what the normal is 
but i would say as far as the social paradigm is concerned maybe you might have to still be connected in this way and please do i feel the biggest silver lining of this particular time which should not cause you any anxiety and stress which should cause you happiness is the fact that you have all become technologically more evolved i myself have become i would say because elderly are not avid to technology or not averse to technology the fact that now you have time to know it and try to do it has even made you even better and i am very sure you are much happier that you are able to learn a new skill even at this age because learning does not have any age so i would say the silver lining of this time is the fact that you have become more and more technologically better if you are not better already doctor you are talking about sharing can you elaborate a little more as to what should the old person do what are the specifics with respect to sharing by like sharing about what the anxiety or thing anxiety and stress yeah 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 so i would say it should be it always is difficult for an older person to share thinking we have been independent their entire lives and do we have to share with people but and it also reflects on the personality some people might be totally introvert some might be extrovert some might not be wanting to share at all by sharing i would mean they should more and more share whatever stresses they are feeling for example if during this time if they are facing stress about the covid if they have some doubts in their life they should keep asking i would say as caregivers it's also our responsibility to keep a check on them and keep asking them sometimes what happens is when we don't ask they don't say so that is something as a caregiver we should do and it the sharing could be with anybody i wouldn't say it's only with family if they feel comfortable with a younger friend a, a, a colleague maybe a person they had met in the park or maybe a, a a neighbor they should try to open up by saying what they are feeling whether their sleep is degrees whether they are feeling oh my god every day i'm getting up to so much stress i want to do something about it but i'm not doing it i don't want to tell my family so they have to slowly get things out another way of course is to pen it down i think if people are not able to say it then they should write it down and then they should sort of express it to that particular person whether it's the family because at least it is letting out if you are not even writing it down you are just spending up emotions inside and then it will only come out when you need real treatment rather than we addressing it before so lot of mediums but i would say if you are not able to express it openly writing is a good way and try to share it with your little i remember in your first uh, session with us uh, when we talked about uh, anxiety and uh, the worries that we had about covid i remember your advice saying that during these tough times pick up the phone talk to people uh, go talk to your neighbors now you can't travel but uh, still talk to your neighbors pick up the phone video call your friends it's the best way of actually handling anxiety i remember that advice and i a lot of people i know are trying that uh, thank you very much for all of you who want to uh, listen to either this or any of the past uh, talks by dr prem on tare social please log on to our website uh, you will be able to do it secondly is those who have not um, uh, who are on this and who have not contacted me in the past please send me a whatsapp or just give me a miss call on my tare social number i will add you onto the mailing list so that we can communicate more often you can be informed of all the other things that we are doing in this space uh, uh having said that thank you very much doctor everybody stay safe and have a nice weekend thank you very much thanks a lot stay calm stay safe thank you thank you okay.